Here at CCM, our membership doesn't need to be told about all the benefits that our main streets bring to our municipalities. From being centers where residents congregate, shop, and eat, to where economic and cultural development happens. We don't need to go on about how much we love our main streets, but sometimes we like to anyway. And we know that the Connecticut Main Street Centers, an organization dedicated to the maintenance and development of these crucial throughways, likes to talk about them too. Today we are joined by their executive director, Michelle McCabe. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Gateway Community College and Housatana Community College. The Municipal Voice is a Connecticut Conference of Municipalities podcast in collaboration with WNHH LP 103.5 FM. I'm your host, Matt Ford. As always, be sure to give us a like and let us know what you're thinking in the comments. CCM's Municipal Voice podcast continues to present a key forum in important state local issues. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the consensus views of CCM or member municipal leaders. Michelle, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. I'm thrilled to be here. That's great to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about the Connecticut Main Street Center and what it is you do there? Sure. So Connecticut Main Street Center is a statewide nonprofit, and our role is to support Main Street vibrancy across the state. So that's anywhere from our urban centers to the smallest village center. Uh, We're there to help make sure that all of the complicated moving parts that make a great Main Street are well-oiled and functioning. And so I'm the executive director, and my role is to, you know, work with our team to find out what the needs are in the community and to create programming to support them. That's really interesting. So maybe we can talk about the history then of the organization um, I read that it was initially started in cooperation with, I guess, Connecticut Light and Power, but yes. then was spun off at some point after that to kind of become its own independent program. Can you talk about some of that? Yes, absolutely. So uh, you are correct that Connecticut Light and Power brought this program to Connecticut. So we are what's called a coordinating program mm-hmm. for Main Street America. And what a coordinating program does that shouldn't surprise you given the name is uh, we work with independent Main Street programs that operate on a community level basis. Mm -hmm. And so we help with all those independent Main Street programs. So there are actually 41 state coordinating programs in the country. Mm -hmm. And we are one of those. So Connecticut Light and Power, I will start also by saying that Um, Many of these coordinating programs do have relationships with utility companies because, as you Mm -hmm. can imagine, there's a lot of shared interest in seeing uh, economic vitality across the entirety of the state and recognizing that a Main Street program is one of those pivotal tools in the toolbox Mm -hmm. to see communities thrive. And, you know, obviously, utility companies want to have businesses and residents and all kinds of people that need power. And so that was the rationale for bringing a coordinating program to the state because mm-hmm. Connecticut Light and Power saw there was a need. And then, yeah. as you mentioned, we did spin off. Oh, goodness. This is, as you may or may not know, I'm with the organization since July. So the the depths oh, okay. of history over its 25 years, I'm not necessarily going to get all of so the So we're testing how much you've studied everything. <laughs> I know, right? I hope I pass my quiz. Um but yes, uh, we did spin off and now we're an independent nonprofit. And even though we still have a relationship with Eversource, uh, it is um, a relationship like we have with a lot of different partners and funders across the state. So uh, CLP, now now known as Eversource, is still a corporate partner friend, but they're not the primary. No. Partner. I mean, you, you're your own thing and you just have a lot of people, different groups and partners that you work with. Well, that's good yes. stuff. Yeah, and absolutely. so you're the the state sort of organization for these local organizations, uh, kind of like how CCM, we, we are the organization of town governments, and then there's the National League of Cities, but we're the state organization. Are there, it sounds like these, we're talking about Boston, um, are there other Main Street organizations all over uh, the United States, or is it kind of unique to Connecticut or the Northeast? No, they are all over. So 41 states have a coordinating program such as ours. And then in some places like Massachusetts, you'll have really large urban centers that Mm -hmm. might be a coordinating program all on their own because there are so many smaller Main Street organizations Mm -hmm. under them that they're helping, you know, to support. So we are not unique in that regard. Mm -hmm. But I will say that compared to other coordinating programs in other states, 
Um, the Northeast in particular, I think, is fairly unique in yeah. that, um, for example, Connecticut, we will we'll work with any community that wants a Main Street experience um, or has a Main Street or a commercial quarter, but they don't have a Main Street organization. Mm-hmm. So we're working with um, economic development directors. We're working with the heads of cultural districts. Uh, as well as working with your sort of traditional Main Street program, like in Westville in New Haven or Upper Albany in Hartford or Bridgeport has a DSSD and we work Mm -hmm. with them. So in that regard, I think Connecticut is really unusual because we're here to support that aspiration Mm -hmm. and we're here to be part of the journey towards what we think is the right end result, which is Every community should really have an independent entity whose sole job is to focus in on that Main Street because they're they're complicated. You know, they're like a garden, really. And you have a lot of moving parts, all of which have to be in balance and harmony and pruned and maintained and responding to, you know, new challenges, new pressures, new realities um, all along the way. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine that New England and the Northeast is sort of a, an interesting environment to be doing this kind of work because we do have in Connecticut 169 towns and they all have historic downtown areas that were set up along a main street and like that idea of community is very deeply ingrained around here so I, I imagine without you know, question without question these towns were born as small community focused villages and stuff and, and grew from there but they weren't planned on big grids like you know some places that west might have been they were always they, they started with that idea and then in some cases maybe straight away from it over the years and are trying to maybe even get back to that sense of downtown community. Yes. And actually it's I would say one of the things that um I've so enjoyed mm-hmm. having uh joined this organization in this role. Um I don't know if it's true for everyone that's born and raised in Connecticut like myself, mm-hmm. but I will say that um it seems to be true that for a state as small as we are, we don't always go too far away from home in our own Mm -hmm. home state, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Um, It's probably not unusual for anybody living anywhere. But I have realized, even though, again, born and raised in Connecticut, I haven't seen probably three quarters of the state is what I realized in this role. And so uh, my uh, team will tell you that anytime I go out anywhere, mm-hmm. I come back like giddy as a, as a school kid. Yeah. Totally excited by, oh my gosh, Manchester. Oh my gosh, Torrington. Oh my gosh, Chester. Like I yeah. just go completely bananas. And what's so cool is that every community is so interesting and unique. Mm-hmm. Like they're all like a whole country really unto themselves yeah. and um we have and that's not true in every place you know like you were mm-hmm. talking about you know newer it's funny to say newer like after the louisiana purchase newer but you know what i'm saying like yeah. newer cities out west in the midwest they were the and communities were built in a very different way and yeah. ours i think show the different layers of history the different you know unique architectural styles um and it's really, it's great and it's exciting. Yeah. And, you know, I love the fact that um, this organization, we have an opportunity to really celebrate, yeah. to celebrate that. Yeah, we, I know we hear a lot about transit-oriented development and walkable communities being big buzzwords right now. But, you know, with, as we say, our, our old towns were born as walkable communities because they were around before cars. So they, they, yes. were, they were set up with, you know, main avenues just going in and out of town as fast as possible uh, as, as the goal. Um, so as you mentioned, like that you are new at at the Main Street Center, and you do get to go out and see these corners of the state that you never explored before, even though you're, you know, a lifelong resident. What are some things that you've learned on some of these, you know, adventures and explorations that were unexpected when you started the job? Um, I think a lot of what I learned is sort of what I've I express, which is that um there are there's such an enormous uh, um, diversity of experience, no matter where you go. There are a wide range of cultural traditions and cuisines and, again, buildings and signage and 
um, and history that, and that there's a kind of community for every kind of person in terms of mm. what you're interested in, you know, and, and even though to your point, um, you know, walkability is so important. You can have, for example, walkability in the middle of a rural community as much mm -hmm. as you can, you know, in a city neighborhood. And so um, that's one thing that I would say that has been just really eye-opening for me, just the opportunities to have very different and interesting quality of life choices based on different places that a person can live in the state of Connecticut. Uh, and the other thing I would say I learned, I've learned is that these, this, all of this um, amazing bounty of opportunity does not come easily. Mm -hmm. You know, really great main streets require a ton of work. All, yeah. all, all um, in and um, of themselves, they require a lot of work. So you're looking at things as as fundamental as sidewalks that are easy to navigate in that don't have, you know, tree roots pushing mm -hmm. up and that they're uneven. So a stroller can't move on them, for example, or a wheelchair or whatever it might be. Parking, trees, signage, wayfinding signage, um, your buildings, are they in good shape? Are they not in good shape? Are some of them in good shape? Are, what is the vacancy like? You know, the residents, um, you know, are there enough places to live? Can the workforce get to and from mm -hmm. work? Can they live where their jobs are? They're just, uh, you know, what kind of events are you putting on and pro how are you programming that space? So many different um, things to manage, so mm -hmm. many things to cultivate. Uh, it's a huge, like I said, it's a huge job. And, um, you know, our communities do an amazing work with limited resources in many ways. You know, yeah. you have folks that have a lot of different um, obligations that extend beyond Main Street uh, and don't necessarily have the time or the bandwidth as much as they would like to, to be able to pay attention to all of yeah. those different pieces. You certainly had some successes with the organization. And I know we featured some of the work that's been going on in our magazine, Connecticut Town and City. Can you talk about some of the, the triumph that you've had? Absolutely. Well, the organization has been around for, as I mentioned, about you know 25 years. And there's been a lot of amazing work that was done over the course of that time. A lot of programs to um, revitalize downtowns, like Come Home to, to uh, Downtown, where it was looking to encourage mixed use development in residential mm -hmm. spaces, you know, on top of retail spaces, um, gatherings and forums, et cetera. But I will say that in the short time that I've been with the organization, we've been fortunate to have a period of tremendous growth. Mm. And with that growth, we have um, new staff members that can really provide that one-on-one um, -on -one intensive guidance to mm -hmm. communities. So we have a new field services director, uh, economic, our education and training director and events manager who um, between the three of them are conducting you know, over 60 field visits that's going into communities and, mm -hmm. and sitting down with the folks that are tasked with managing their main streets. Um, we've put on uh, over 16 webinars in the past year plus uh, that covered a range of topics that were really timely from how to start a cultural district to small scale manufacturing on main street to um, lighting and mm -hmm. how important lighting is. Um, we've developed an 86 point assessment tool, which we're really excited about. This is an opportunity for us to go into a community. Mm -hmm. We look at that main street from the four points, which is the methodology that we employ, which is okay. how strong is your organization, your board, your staff, your volunteers, um, the promotion, what are you doing to highlight your main street for both the community or for business recruitment, whatever that might be mm -hmm. that your, you know, your vision is. Um, economic vitality, again, looking at inventorying your businesses, your buildings, your vacancies, and finding the right kinds of businesses and organizations and entertainment venues that would belong on your main street. And then design, again, going back to sidewalks yeah. and beautification. And so this tool allows us to go in, we, we, score a community in 86 ways okay. and then they get a report that gives them a whole host of suggestions and mm -hmm. connects them to resources to be able to 
enact a roadmap to whatever their vision is for their main street. So um, we've had some great events. Once yeah. the world opened up again, our spotlight on main event, we were able to showcase Coventry and Middletown and Torrington and all the exciting uh, goings on on their main streets there. So uh, we've had a great, a great year plus. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. Talking about, you know, being able to get out there again, you know, cultural events and that sort of thing. One of the programs that we have featured in uh, our magazine is uh, the cultural district districts of Connecticut. Um, a lot of people, you know, have a general idea what a cultural district is. It you know, makes sense. It's where the theaters and museums are. But now it is uh, an official designation in the state of Connecticut. Can you talk to us about why putting resources into cultural spaces is important? Oh, absolutely. It's critical. It is critical for, I would say, all of, um, you know, if we're looking at the success of Connecticut as a state, I think mm -hmm. investing in our cultural assets is is important to see those economic benefits realized. I mean, as, in a, aside from the fact that obviously this sector employs people, uh, it is what brings a Main Street, for example, to life, is when mm -hmm. you have theaters and music venues and performance spaces. It brings people into the downtown. Uh, it's an opportunity for those same people to patronize restaurants, patronize stores. Um, children's museums are a huge benefit to Main Street. So, uh, and, and they also serve another really important purpose that I think doesn't get um, discussed often enough, which is mm -hmm. They build community, you yeah. know, they activate a public space and they get people together. They get people to think about, you know, important issues or to feel things emotionally and then connect with each other around those issues. And so I think what's great about the cultural district is in addition to sort of shining a light on the cultural assets of a community, mm -hmm. the fact that you're showing geographically how they're connected uh, mm -hmm. How you can walk from one to the other. It it encourages people to spend a whole day in a given community or a resident to go to their downtown and yeah. park their car or walk to their downtown and spend the day there. And also, I think it gives uh, a community an opportunity uh, to cross market mm -hmm. once that, that cultural district's in place. So it allows for again, the retailers and the other kinds of businesses on a main street, for example, the restaurants, uh, for them to partner with their arts and culture mm -hmm. uh, organizations in their town to come up with some, you know, unique ways to partner to engage the wider community. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sounds really like it's a big part of what you're trying to do is get that the interconnectedness and the people when they're in to, to within the culture, the cultural district to go from the theater and maybe get some dinner afterwards and just kind of really appreciate the interconnectedness of all these things where, again, where we are in New Haven, you know, we still have some of the scars of like the urban renewal of the 50s, where the idea was get workers in and out to the suburbs as fast as possible. So they knock down neighborhoods and put, you know, quick roads that are straight along through. And now in the last decades, you know, some of those areas are being redeveloped and they're putting in crosswalks and things to slow traffic and just that change of, of attitudes is really interesting. Do you see in the work you do a changing definition of what a successful Main Street looks like? You know, when when I think back to my childhood and you talk about going down to Main Street, you know, I mean, say well, but you know, they're five and dime when you go get the candy and like that was part of the, the thing. Like, does the definition of what a downtown looks like change as as we progress? That is such a fantastic question um, for a lot of different reasons. I think the one thing that, one main thing we've discovered in all of this is that flexibility mm. and the opportunity for a main street to shift, you know, with built-in resiliency mm -hmm. is really important because even without a global pandemic, Mm -hmm. people's tastes change, things change. And so um, one has to be able to adapt. Yeah. 
what makes for a successful Main Street today is mm -hmm. still uh, an unanswered question because we are still, I don't, we're still in a state of flux as mm -hmm. a response to what we went through with COVID for the last mm -hmm. year and a half. Yeah. I think on the one hand, we're seeing people uh, as far as where they live mm -hmm. gravitating towards a main street that has a lot going on, that feels alive, mm -hmm. that's attractive, that's busy with people, not necessarily with cars, yeah. busy with people, that's stimulating. We know that um, having public spaces and the mm -hmm. ability to be in public spaces and out in the outdoors, mm -hmm. um, that it was critically important when we were in lockdown or yeah. when we were easing out of lockdown, but we're still very restricted. Um, and, and we can't lose that focus. We mm -hmm. have to still, I think, um, view the street as bigger than what we used to view it as. Yeah. But I will, I will also say at the same time, you know, it used to be that downtowns and main streets uh, during the day cater to office workers. So now like busy times and slow times aren't what they were before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, people's behaviors have changed as far as their consumer behavior. So we're yeah. seeing, for example, restaurants um, are doing well, I think, but we're seeing that um, one, uh, some of our, our arts organizations a little less so like audience numbers have not returned to mm. what they were. Um, not sure why, maybe it's because an older audience patronized certain establishments more than a younger one and there's still hesitancy. I'm not sure. Uh, again, retail has really suffered quite a mm -hmm. bit. Uh, and I think, again, that's a combination of consumer behavior, but also, you know, if you're seeing the workforce get pushed farther and farther away from their jobs, yeah. it's those jobs in retail and restaurant um, that are really struggling to find the workers to work there. So yeah. um, I think that we're still trying to figure out um, what Main Street, what a vibrant Main Street is going to look like. Yeah, I imagine that would make the, the culture districts even more important when people don't have to go to downtown to go to work. Why, why do they choose to go downtown? And it has to be the, the culture, the the nightlife, the museums, the restaurants. I imagine that that'll only become more and more important as people can work from wherever. So you have to really make a, reasons for them to come to downtowns. Or reasons to live there. And I or think that's where we're there, yeah. seeing, that's where we're seeing a lot of, you know, growth and success is getting people to want to live in downtown mm -hmm. uh, is definitely, uh, you know, one of the ways forward, undoubtedly. Yeah. As we continue to have, you know, unoccupied office spaces, maybe some of those spaces are turning over to become residential. It's really in some places. Stuff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting stuff. Um, so you guys do recognize excellence in the programs that you oversee. And you recently announced your 2023 award winners, Liz Shapiro uh, from the director of the Connecticut Office of Arts, who won the Jack Shanahan Award for Public Services, um, in part for the Cultural Districts Program. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that award and uh, what Liz did to deserve it? Absolutely. So uh, the Jack Shanahan Award uh, was established in honor of the former director of the Connecticut Historical Commission and the mm -hmm. State Historic Preservation Office and uh, was a founder and a first board chair of this organization. Okay. And so with this award, we recognize uh, public and private sector individuals and organizations that exemplify a high standard of leadership with a mm -hmm. deep commitment to the success of Connecticut's main streets. And so we were really thrilled to honor Liz Shapiro with this particular award because, as you mentioned, she created this incredible program that yeah. not only serves the arts organizations and main streets in in how it can function and sort of as a, a way to mm -hmm. advertise these wonderful assets, mm -hmm. um, but, but also, uh, you know, recognizing that it's a contributing factor to to the quality of life that we treasure mm -hmm. so much, you know, here in the state. And so her leadership, especially 
now that we're recovering from the pandemic with this program, I think is just going to be really key yeah. for a lot of municipalities to uh, plot an exciting uh, course forward. That's really cool. And were there uh, other awards given out in addition to that one? Yeah. So we have a Founders Award. Who, who got uh, that this year? Uh, Kim Parsons Whitaker, who okay. was with Connecticut Main Street for over 20 years and oh, has wow. been such a force in the state to champion this methodology of the four mm -hmm. points, uh, but also to be a voice for Main Streets uh, for all of the those who need to hear how yeah. wonderful they are and how they should be resourced. And so she is now doing amazing work with the Department of Economic and Community Development. And mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to thank her on behalf of not only our organization, but also for Main Streets across the state. And we actually, uh, we have a new award this year, the mm -hmm. Quentin Williams Downtown Hero Award, uh, named in honor of State Representative Q Williams, whose yeah. loss is just absolutely devastating uh, to yeah. us and to the state. And uh, he was a real champion for downtowns. He did a lot uh, in Middletown with his downtown and was a member, actually the founding member of the Main Street Working Group at the legislature to make yeah. sure that you know people were aware of how important Main Streets are. And so this award, um, it honors uh, those who embody his greatest strength. So mm -hmm. that tireless advocacy, being collaborative, um, bringing a multitude of voices to the fore. And so we are awarding it to Sarah Nielsen this year, who's mm -hmm. the executive director of Simsbury's Main Street program and her heroic efforts to keep her Main Street and Main Street businesses afloat uh, during the pandemic when as you, we all yeah. are scarred by remembering just you know, how chaotic and frightening and uncertain things were for much of the time. And, you know, she was out there, you know, working tirelessly yeah. to make sure that her businesses, you know, were able to get the PPE and and the support that they needed. And so we're really excited to be presenting her with that award. That's really cool. It sounds like she's done a lot of great work and it's a really nice way to honor Q's memory. Uh, yes. Um, Talking about some of the, the the pandemic and you know trying to get through it all and you know everyone panicking trying to figure out like how to deal with it when when it all hit um, you know there was a lot of changes that that came around rather quickly. One of the things that, that's visible to us is the explosion of outdoor dining and things like that. Do you support now that you know the pandemic's dying down, the uh, outdoor dining as a continued thing? You know more of it in our downtowns. I do think that, you know, certainly part of it is a community by community decision based mm -hmm. on where they are. But I will say that overall, absolutely. I think that one of the, the lessons of the pandemic was that things that we thought we had to do the way we've always done them got mm -hmm. completely thrown out the window. And I think we learned a lot about what it means to open up a sidewalk and what it means to close down part of a street. And thinking that, you know, disaster is going to strike because mm -hmm. we're doing this crazy thing and then finding out actually not at all, you know, that yeah. it's bringing more people, more foot traffic, more energy, more life to a street. Mm -hmm. And so, and actually um, we do have additional awards of excellence for individual communities. Oh, cool. And one of our winners is Norwich. And one of the reasons why we're awarding Norwich is because they started a really great parklet program for their restaurant. Yes. So parklets are those constructed spaces where the outdoor mm -hmm. dining takes place. So, you know, some of them have. Oh, so it takes up like a, like a little, uh, maybe even a single parking spot or two parking spots. Correct. And so it's, it's actually a, a constructed space. And so, mm -hmm. you know, they can be also beautified and decorated with flowers and lights mm -hmm. and et cetera. And they just did a really wonderful job and, um, Kevin Brown from the Norwich Development Corporation was saying how it really just brought a lot of life to Norwich's mm -hmm. downtown. Um, so yeah, we I think outdoor dining is is here to stay. Yeah, and I think it's it's a great a great new way to enjoy enjoy a main street. Yeah, and with some of the other things coming out of the pandemic, you mentioned before that you have a lot of webinar stuff. Did some of that come out of adapting to having to do things online? Oh, undoubtedly. Yes. Yes. And I will say, um, 
this organization did an amazing job of consistently and constantly creating content that was being, um, that was there to guide and engage mm -hmm. our members while, again, the world was shut down. And it was about, you know, different ways that they can recover from, think about uh, new best practices, all of that online. And I think that we saw a lot of people were really taking that time to learn about new things uh, that mm -hmm. they could do, certainly once the world started opening up a bit. Yeah. And I think we, again, speaking of, you know, things that we learned from this experience is that online content is great. And, yeah. you know, what's wonderful about webinars, we have all of our webinars on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. You know, people are always going back to them, refreshing their memory on certain things that we talked about, um, can watch yeah. them at their leisure. And so it's a really new way to educate and reach people. Yeah. But I will say, too, um, we're still going to have a really strong and robust webinar series come mm -hmm. our next year. Our next year starts in July. Uh, but um, we're definitely also looking to do more in-person uh, trainings and gatherings as well, yeah. because I do think that we're seeing people are have missed the mm -hmm. experience of being in person with people. And um, I think uh, there's definitely been an uptick in mm -hmm. people's willingness and interest in getting out of the house, putting yeah. on a pair of actual slacks and mm -hmm. get out of their sweatpants and uh, come and see people. So uh, we'll be doing a lot more of that as well. <laughs> yeah, that is cool. But it sounds like it's not going to replace doing things in person, but it's another tool in the toolbox now that you can use to get your messages out there. Absolutely. I think that we're still, we're on a path to figuring out uh, there are certain activities that are great to be doing in a virtual environment. Mm -hmm. And then there are certain activities just, just simply aren't. And uh, so when we were talking, for example, about taking all of our office space and making it into residential, not that mm -hmm. we said that, but, you know, I think that we're going to see, you know, things are going to shift and change still. I think that we mm -hmm. haven't seen the end of um, where people are going to choose to be yeah. uh, to do certain things, whether those activities are leisure or professional or, or whatever they may be. Yeah. I think we're going to see a lot of different options and a lot of different interests. Yeah. And so, I mean, I guess talking about that, one thing we always kind of like to close out the show with is talking about the future and where we th see things going. So what does the future hold for the Connecticut Main Street Center in you know, 2024 and beyond? Um, well, first, I think some of it is building on our what we've always done well, which is bringing new best practices, new information and guidance on how mm -hmm. to manage a main street. Um, obviously, what that means has changed a lot and will continue to change. And our organization is um, you know, committed to staying on top of what best practices are out there mm -hmm. that we can employ. Um, I will say that we are looking to really be a, an organization that contributes to the larger vision that I know Connecticut has for mm -hmm. itself, which is attracting and retaining a skilled workforce, attracting and retaining businesses, mm -hmm. and highlighting, again, all of the wonderful things that um, that we have to offer on yeah. every main street that exists in Connecticut, all of the the beauty and the interesting things and the interesting people, the yeah. arts, the culture and all of that. So, you know, I see Connecticut Main Street continuing doing what it's always done, which is making sure that every community's Main Street is a success. Yeah. And it sounds like you are. Are you optimistic about the future of the Main Streets themselves in Connecticut? Oh, absolutely. I could not be more optimistic because I think that I can't speak for the past, but I can mm -hmm. say for the present, people are really paying attention and caring about, about main streets. Yeah. And I also will say that in terms of bringing people together, mm -hmm. main streets are everybody's neighborhood. And I think that it's an opportunity for us to commune with each other, to heal together, to spend time together, to be in each other's presence. And I think that, um, you know, we, 
Main Street's has such an important role to play in all of that. So I see Main Street's only becoming more important and critical as we move forward. Great. Well, Michelle McCabe, thanks for coming on today and talking to us about the Connecticut Main Street Center. It's been really interesting. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. We'd like to thank our guest, Michelle McCabe. We'd like to thank our sponsors at Gateway Community College and Housatonic Community College. Learn more at gatewayct.edu and housatonic.edu. The Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WNHH 103.5 FM. Kevin Maloney is our executive producer. Christopher Gilson is our producer. Harry draws it on the boards. And I'm Matt Ford, your host. Be sure to check out our Facebook page and give us a like and watch out for a CCM chat series on our YouTube page.